Okay. Welcome to Philosophy for Living on Earth, coming to you live from the Ayn Rand Institute. This is our uh, weekly web series uh, exploring life's big questions and the answers to those questions coming from the ideas of Ayn Rand. So I'm Keith Lockich and I'm your host this week. And today we're gonna talk about history. Our big question for today is what drives history? So let's jump right in. So what drives history? What I'm getting at here is, you know, what is it that explains the sort of major developments and trends that have shaped our world through the ages? And let me focus this question a little more to make it clearer why this matters. I mean, who cares what drives history? So why does this matter? Well, the period following the Middle Ages was a time of incredible progress in the West, right? You had the Renaissance and the scientific revolution. And this culminated in the Enlightenment, which saw an absolute explosion in human knowledge and in people's ability to apply knowledge to the improvement of human life. You know, then you have the founding of America and the Industrial Revolution, and there was an unprecedented level of political freedom and an unprecedented improvement in the length and quality of people's lives. You had a culture in which people viewed this kind of progress as inevitable and limitless, right? But then Western culture changed. And instead of you know, endless inevitable progress, you had the 20th century with world wars you know, that killed millions of people. <clears throat> and you had murderous ideologies like Nazism and communism enslaving half the world and killing you know, by the tens and even hundreds of millions. So part of what I'm getting at here, when I'm asking what drives history, part of what I'm trying to get at here is how does something like that happen? You know, how do you go from a culture in which progress is what seems, you know, endless and inevitable to a culture that's hell bent on genocide and destruction? So this is part of what I'm asking. I want to ask what drives history is, you know, how do you explain that kind of civilizational shift? Um, you know, how do you go from like Isaac Newton and the steam engine to concentration camps and ethnic cleansing and the dictatorship of the proletariat, right? Now, I think the first thing to recognize and to acknowledge is that obviously there are going to be lots of different factors involved here, right? I mean, we're, we're talking about the actions of, of, you know, countless people over the course of centuries. So obviously there are going to be many different causes that account for all the complex and multifaceted events in human history, right? But the question I'm really trying to get at here is, is there a fundamental cause that explains the big picture, right? Is there an ultimate cause that directs the overall sweep of history and that can explain the kind of fundamental shift I just described, you know, from, from the enlightenment to you know, Hitler and Stalin, right? Now, Ayn Rand argued that there is such a fundamental cause and that that cause is philosophy. In her view, the primary force that drives history is the basic philosophic ideas that shape people's beliefs and values and as a result, shape their choices and actions. Now, to give a full explanation of Rand's view would take more time than we have here today, because, I mean, this is, we're talking about a topic that deals with like the vast sweep of Western civilization spanning thousands of years, right? And it involves, you know, the philosophical systems developed by the greatest philosophers of history, right? Plato, Aristotle, Kant, and so on. So in a short presentation, you know, I'm not going to be able to give anywhere near a kind of full presentation of this perspective. So what I, what I plan to do is just to give some broad outlines and give you some examples to give an indication of Rand's view and to give you a sense that this is a plausible perspective. And I'll give you some references at the end where you can explore this in much more detail. All right, so let's plunge in here. And, and I want to start in the dark ages and ask the question, you know, why were they dark, right? Why were the dark ages dark? And I think this is a real question because, you know, the ancient world, ancient Greece especially, saw the first flowering of human knowledge 
with the birth of philosophy and mathematics and science and literature, right? There, there was this flowering of, of human knowledge and, and, and values in ancient Greece, okay? And then you have the fall of Rome and you have literally hundreds of years of poverty and stagnation. So why is that? Why were the dark ages so dark? And I think the short answer is that in the dark and middle ages, people took religion seriously. Now, I think it's hard for us today to really grasp what that even means concretely, right? We live in a culture where people live basically secular lives. You know, maybe they go to church on Sunday, people pay lip service to religion, okay? But the culture of the dark and middle ages was one where people really took seriously that the path to salvation is faith, obedience, sacrifice, right? Their focus was not on trying to, you know, understand the natural world through reason and science. It was, it was on having faith in the supernatural and obeying religious authority. They took that seriously, right? Their focus was not working to produce values and achieve a happy life in this world. Their focus was on, you know, storing up their treasures in heaven and preparing for the afterlife, right? So um, as, as, the, as the objectivist philosopher Leonard Peikoff puts it, the dark ages were dark on principle, right? People took religion seriously and they, and they acted on it. Okay, so that's why the dark ages were dark. So then the question is, how do you go from that in the span of a few hundred years to the age of enlightenment, which had a completely opposite cultural spirit, right? It had a completely opposite cultural enlightenment. Now, Ayn Rand's answer to this is that there was one fundamental cause that brought about that change, the change from the dark ages over centuries to the enlightenment. The one fundamental cause was the rediscovery of Aristotle's philosophy. So Aristotle's works, you know, had been preserved in the Muslim world and they were reintroduced into the West in the 12th and 13th centuries. And Aristotle's philosophy is the polar opposite of faith, obedience, sacrifice, right? In essence, the Aristotelian worldview is that there is only one reality, this one, you know, the natural world. There is no heaven or supernatural realm. <clears throat> And, and man has the faculty of reason that can give him real knowledge about reality. There's no, there's nothing, there's no value in faith and obedience. What's important is the quest to understand the world using the faculty of reason. So as Western thinkers rediscovered these ideas and began to take them seriously, instead of taking religion seriously, the result over time was the Renaissance and the scientific revolution. You know, Renaissance is French for rebirth, right? What was reborn was the respect for reason. You know, how else do you explain the fact that thinkers like Copernicus and Galileo and Newton, you know, were able to devote their lives to studying how nature works and they were able to write books and they were, and they were respected and taken seriously as thinkers. It's only because people were starting to take reason seriously. And because people were gradually coming to accept the idea that the way to understand the world is not through faith and authoritarian dogmas, but by sensory observation and logic and reason. Now, of course, it wasn't all smooth sailing, right? I mean, you know, Galileo is the iconic symbol of the clash between faith and reason. He was persecuted by the Inquisition for daring to challenge religious dogma. So this didn't happen overnight, right? It was, a, it was a gradual process that took centuries. But over time, the West was able to throw off the shackles of Christian dogma in favor of reason and science. And that is how we ultimately got to the Enlightenment. So again, the primary cause of this transition is the most fundamental ideas that people held about reality and reason <coughs> and man's place in the universe. So as Aristotelian philosophy came to dominate the culture, the result was the enlightenment. Okay, so we've looked at why the dark ages were dark, 
And we've looked a little bit at why the enlightenment was enlightened, okay? Now let's look, try to, to turn back briefly to the question we started with. So how did we get from, you know, the enlightenment then to, you know, Auschwitz, right? Well, again, Ayn Rand's answer is that there was one fundamental cause that brought about that change. Now, again, let me just reiterate, you know, there were tons and tons of secondary and tertiary and beyond causes, okay? Um, but the perspective is that there was one fundamental cause that brought about this shift. And that is a new philosophical system that emerged in the late 1700s, okay? And let me actually give you a quote from Rand where she expresses this view. If you ask me to name the man most responsible for the present state of the world, the man whose influence has almost succeeded in destroying the achievements of the Renaissance, I will name Immanuel Kant. He was the philosopher who saved the morality of altruism and who knew that what it had to be saved from was reason. So that's a, a quote from a lecture by Ayn Rand, which I'll, I'll reference later as well. Okay, now, Again, in the space of a few minutes here, I can't really do justice to, you know, Rand's view of Kant's whole philosophy and how it influenced history. I, I realized yesterday when I was preparing this that I was maybe a little bit ambitious in, in trying to present this whole perspective on, you know, Rand's perspective on how philosophy drives history. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it's an interesting topic and I want to press on anyway. So let me just, let me say a little bit here to sketch the essential ideas of, of, you know, Rand's perspective on Kant's philosophy and how that influenced history. Okay. In essence, there were two key issues that were instrumental in this transition. Remember, we're trying to ask, you know, how did we get from the Enlightenment to uh, the horrors of the 20th century and, and uh, um, totalitarian ideologies and that sort of thing? In essence, there were two key ideas that were instrumental in this transition. The, the, the questions about the validity of reason and the moral status of altruism, okay? So as we've seen, right, the, the enlightenment rested on Aristotle's defense of reason, okay? Over through, through the Renaissance and the scientific revolution, as scientists began applying reason to ever expanding areas of human knowledge, and as philosophers worked to try to understand more deeply, you know, exactly how does reason operate? What is the nature of this faculty? And how, is it, how is it connected to reality? How do we really know things? All kinds of questions arose about the validity of reason and about how our rational faculty actually functions. And there were important questions that needed to be answered in order to really make sense of this. Okay. Now, right at that crucial moment in history, Immanuel Kant came along and undercut the foundations of reason altogether. This is the, this is the perspective here. So again, let me, let me read you a quote from Rand of, um, in which she gives her description of what happened. Here. Quote, there are two ways to destroy the power of a concept. One, by an open attack in open discussion. The other, by subversion from the inside. That is, by subverting the meaning of the concept, setting up a straw man, and then refuting it. Kant did the second. He did not attack reason. Just as an aside here, you know, if you, if you, if you look at the history of philosophy, people often uh, view Kant as a defender of reason. You know, he's, he was, you know, someone who came out in favor of reason. And this is part of what Ayn Rand is explaining here. When we return to the quote, he did not attack reason. He, re he merely constructed such a version of what is reason that it made mysticism look like plain, rational, common sense by comparison. He did not deny the validity of reason. He merely claimed that reason is limited that it leads, to, it leads us to impossible contradictions, that everything we perceive is an illusion and that we can never perceive reality or things as they are. He claimed in effect that the things we perceive are not real because we perceive them, unquote. Okay, so right at the moment in history when what was needed was a clarification of how it is 
that reason actually keeps us in touch with reality. What we got instead was a view that we are fundamentally cut off from reality. And this was a major shift in people's thinking. And it led to, you know, over decades and, and beyond, a gradual decline in people's confidence in the power of reason. Now, we already saw the result of an era marked by a rejection of reason, right? By people's, people holding the view that reason is not um, a, a, a guide to understanding the world. By the 20th century, people en masse had returned to that dark ages mindset of bestowing faith in authoritarian leaders, right? So instead of with, 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 with the um, foundations of reason undercut and people's confidence in reason sort of shattered, they returned to the mindset that people had in the dark ages where, you know, we have to have faith in our in, in faith and obedience, right? So this is part of the answer to the question of how then do you get the rise to power of, you know, Hitler and Stalin and Mao and the genocidal murderers of the last century. They have a fundamental turning point in philosophy, and that starts a fundamental shift in the whole direction of history. Okay, so that's part of the answer. Now, the other issue that was critical in this transition is the issue of altruism as a moral ideal. So let me say just a little bit about that. Now, the idea that, you know, altruistic self-sacrifice is the essence of morality has been the dominant moral perspective for almost all of human history, right? I mean, this is the moral ideal that's offered by Christianity, right? The moral ideal is Jesus on the cross sacrificing himself for the sake of sinners, right? Now, in the Enlightenment, as people began more and more to, you know, think for themselves, there was increasingly an implicit view that it's right for people to live for themselves. And this was, this was reflected in the idea of, you know, an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? There was sort of, there was sort of an implicit challenge to the morality of altruism. So again, uh, growing out of people's application of reason to human life, their questions emerged that, you know, needed to be resolved, not in this case, not questions about the validity of reason, but questions in moral philosophy, right? And once again, on this issue as well, Kant stepped in and undercut the foundations. And uh, this is an, uh, uh, another long quote, but this is my last long quote from Ayn Rand, um, giving her description of Kant's approach to ethics. Quote, his version of morality makes the Christian one sound like a healthy, cheerful, benevolent code of selfishness. Christianity merely told men to love his neighbor as himself. That's not exactly rational, but at least it does not forbid man to love himself. What Kant propounded was full, total, abject selflessness. He held that an action is moral only if you perform it out of a sense of duty and derive no benefit from it of any kind, neither material nor spiritual. If you derive any benefit, your action is not moral any longer." Unquote. So right at the moment when America's founding fathers were creating a political system to protect people's freedom to engage you know, in the pursuit of happiness, the most important philosopher of the day was reinforcing the opposite morality, the morality of altruistic duty and self-sacrifice. And again, you know, the result decades and, you know, a century later, by the end of, by the 20th century, the result of this was entire nations willing to demand sacrifices in the name of the race, the Fuhrer, the proletariat, the collective, okay? So again, you have a fundamental turning point in philosophy that starts this fundamental shift in the whole direction of history. So on the question, you know, how do you explain so dramatic a shift from the culture of the Enlightenment era 
to the irrationalism and destruction of the 20th century, Ayn Rand's answer to this is you can only explain it by means of you know, a fundamental dramatic shift in basic ideas. Uh, you know, the, the fundamental shift from Aristotelianism to Kantianism. Um, you know, th that's a, you know, that's a, that's uh, a, a, a massive intellectual shift that uh, is the only thing that can explain that kind of cultural shift. So her perspective is that Kant's view of reason and his perspective on morality are the basic cause responsible for that transition and that it's it's philosophy that drives history okay Whew, that was that was a lot but let me let me wrap up here and let me close i want to close by giving a, a quote from leonard peacock um, this is one of my favorite quotes it just it eloquently summarizes rand's whole theory of of the role of philosophy in history in one sentence here's what dr peacock writes the essence of the idea is that, quote, the books of philosophers are the beginning. Step by step, the books turn into motives, passions, statues, politicians, and headlines, unquote. So <laughs> what do you think of that? I, I love that quote. Um, so that's the essence of, of Ren's theory of history, that it's, that it's philosophy that drives history and leads to all the other consequences. Okay. So that was a very condensed overview of, of a big subject. But if there's one thing that you take away from the presentation, um, you know, the one thing that I hope I've convinced you of is that Rand's perspective on history and the role of philosophy in history is, is unique and compelling. Now, I promised at the beginning that I, I'd give you some references where you can explore this issue further. Um, and so let me do that now. Now, for, so for, for Ayn Rand, you know, if you if you haven't already read them, of course, her novels are absolute must reads. So you need to read The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged at the very least. And then I would suggest um, in her in her essay collection, Philosophy Who Needs It, the title essays, you know, Philosophy Who Needs It, gives her perspective on the role that philosophy plays in in the life of each of us as an individual. And, it, and she talks about how philosophy shapes our, our choices and our actions and our thoughts, you know, whether we know it or not, whether we think we're influenced by philosophy or not, philosophy is the fundamental force that shapes each of our individual lives. And an implication of that is, is how it shapes uh, you know, cultures and history. So I think it's important to, to read what she says in philosophy who needs it. Um, and the second, essay from that collection is the one that I was quoting throughout this presentation. It's called Faith and Force, the Destroyers of the Modern World. So she gives a very, you know, you know, uh, uh, an essentialized overview of, of her perspective on some of the issues that we just talked about. Another essay that you could look at is the title essay of her book For the New Intellectual. So this again takes a uh, looks at the broad sweep of history and gives Rand's very philosophical perspective on what's going on throughout history. Um, and other other uh, things, other references that I think are are just kind of required reading on this subject. Um, Leonard Peikoff's book Objectivism: The Philosophy of Ayn Rand. I mean, the whole book gives you uh, Ayn Rand's philosophy. The very last section of that book is an epilogue where he, he gives a presentation, a summary, a, a kind of a sketch of Ayn Rand's philosophy of history. And it's called The Duel Between Plato and Aristotle. Um, so that's required reading. And then I think um, on this particular topic, the other thing that's really essential is Dr. Peikoff's book, The Ominous Parallax. Um, so this is, this, is a, this is a detailed study of how German philosophy, Kantian, you know, and post-Kantian philosophy led to Nazism. Um, and uh, I wanted to point out, I, I didn't have a cover of this, but I wanted to hold this up here. So there's a version of this book uh, that was released recently called The Cause of Hitler's Germany um, by Leonard Peikoff. And it's basically, um, it's basically just the chapters in the ominous parallels that deal with Germany. So that so the ominous parallels is a study of, of parallels between um, you know Germany leading up to the Nazi era and contemporary America, 
um, and a version was produced that sort of cuts out the chapters on America and just focuses on explaining, you know, the rise of Nazism. So that's another version of the book that you could look at. Okay. So I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. And in just a minute, I'm gonna be joined by my colleague, Aaron Smith, who's gonna help me moderate the Q&A and who knows way more about both Kant and Aristotle than I do. So I'm really glad that he's joining me for the Q&A. Um, just a couple things before we turn to the Q&A. Um, next week, we have another webinar next week and our presenter is gonna be Ben Bayer. Um, the question he'll be discussing is, is there a rational morality? So, you know, be sure to join in next week, same bat time, same bat channel, uh, Wednesday, one week from today, and you can register um, register for the whole web series, okay? And um, if you have any big questions you'd like to take, like us to take up, you know, we're, we're always interested in finding out what you want to know, so webinars at einrand.org. And... Let's do, I think we still do this audience poll. So we're trying to, we're trying to, um, if you've been watching these webinars for a while, you know that what our goal here is to try to reach um, people who are fairly new to Ayn Rand's ideas. So I'm just gonna put up this poll. And we wanna poll people on their familiarity with Ayn Rand's ideas. Uh, is it? There it is. Okay, so let me launch the poll. So just tell us, you know, What's your familiarity? Is, is she someone you've never even heard of or are you, are you already super familiar with her? I'll just leave that up uh, for a little while. Here. Okay, and let's see. Okay, so with that, let me turn off my uh, slide and Aaron, you can uh, jump in. Hi, Keith. Hi, what do you think? Yeah, so I'm moderating the the uh, the Q and A here, so I'll be looking away from the screen every once in a while. I get two screens here. We're monitoring on uh, your comments and questions on Facebook, YouTube, and Periscope, um, yeah. as well as the stuff on uh, Zoom here. So I'll be looking back and forth and fielding some questions. Um, <clears throat> let me ask one question. So you, one of the things that you've done is to indicate the ways in which Rand thinks that. Uh, philosophy drives history and you've taken some um fundamental kind of really important eras in history to illustrate this um but so let me ask a question this is for, coming from a question what's what's this guy's name asfawasan on facebook and he puts it does ayn Rand mean that behind every historical event there are the forces of philosophy um because you talked in terms of broad historical kind of movements or eras in effect. Um, so what would you say to that? Well, I guess it depends what you mean by behind, right? You know, I, I, I don't think her view is that, you know, for every specific event that occurs, you know, this country invades this country or, or you know, this artist produces this sculpture, you know, that you can point to philosophy and say, here was the cause. What, you, what the idea here is that, um, is that what philosophy provides is a very fundamental perspective on the universe, on our, our ability to know the universe, on the nature of man and his relationship to the universe, and on, on what is good and evil and what, what's the right way to live. And um, so she has a perspective of, of how that influences people on an individual level and then you know how does that influence whole cultures so you know you can't so the the point is um like i, I mentioned the example of a sculpture so she's not going to be able to say yes michelangelo sculpted the david because you know some specific thing da, 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 da. she's saying she's saying that because of the influence of of Aristotelianism and the rediscovery of paganism, you know, I mean, I mean, people, people were on the premise that it was legitimate to go back and dig up, they rediscovered ancient Greek sculpture and were like, wow, this is amazing. You know, who knew you could create sculptures like this? And so, so there was an influence there. And within that cultural milieu, you have a genius like Michelangelo arise and, you know, 
create the David. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if that clarifies it at all, or if it's just really stating the same thing, but it's, but philosophy is a, is a fundamental cause that shapes the overall big picture. Um, I don't think you can, yeah. You, did you want to jump in there? Or yeah, I mean, so uh, let me ask the question, also I'll comment a little bit, but uh, let me ask, we got two other questions that are coming at the same issue from a different angle. And I think it might be helpful to just to put them on the table to kind of help, uh, help provide uh, the answers to this. One question, this is coming from an anonymous viewer on Zoom. The question is, if philosophy is the primary driver of history, what is the secondary or tertiary, et cetera? Uh, and another question uh, is, um, there are other factors. Why is philosophy the ultimate driver? So one of the question is, why is it ultimate? And then, well, what are the other ones? Like, what are, what are the competitors uh, or other causes? Uh, and you mentioned in one in one case, well, <laughs> I mean, if you look at something like Michelangelo, it's because Michelangelo happened. And it's like, you know, the, because, you know, there happened to be a genius uh, who devoted himself to a particular type of work. And he was particularly talented, amazing, <laughs> whatever. And, you know, you can't, philosophy didn't create Michelangelo. But there's a, there's, there's more going on there, but so what are some of the other factors and why is philosophy the ultimate driver? I think what would be helpful is to, is, is to offer contrasting views on what are the causes of history. Because I think that part, that's part of, um, of where, what's, where these questions might be coming from. So what are some other perspectives that people have offered on what it is that drives history? I mean, take a look at something like Marxism, right? So Marx has a view of history he has a view of, of what drives history, and his view is that what drives history is, is economic factors. You know, the factors of production condition people's minds to, you know, and, you, and that creates these classes, and they clash, and then they synthesize, you know, and, it, and it's a totally deterministic perspective um, uh, that what drives history is the economic factors of production, right? Or, you know, you have, you have other thinkers who there's the, there's this idea of like the great man theory of history that what what that that um, what drives the what drives the trends of history is great individuals just arise you know your your um, Charlemagne and your Alexander the Great and your Napoleons and people like that and they come up and they dominate and that's what drives history and so so that's the kind of contrasting view that. Uh, this is differentiated from that it's it's not um, deterministic forces you know uh, uh, economic forces and it's not uh, just random ar arising of great individuals you know who dominate it's it's ideas it's ideas that shape the trends of history um, and for and in this case it's fundamental philosophical ideas so let me I want to add to that I, yeah I I think so. I think that's right. But I want to add to this to say, um, so here's another force um, that moves and influences history. It's scientific achievements, particular scientific achievements, discoveries, advances in human knowledge that sort of level us up as, a, as, a, as an intellectual culture uh, and make possible all sorts of technological applications and that really revolutionize uh, an era and so on. So these aren't philosophers. Newton's not a philosopher, um, though I think he's philosophical, but he's not a philosopher. Uh, Galileo's not a philosopher. Um, you know, Pasteur is not a philosopher. Darwin's not a philosopher, right? But it's their achievements and their advances in knowledge really kind of move a history forward. But what philosophy does in this regard, in all of those cases, is it's good and it's possible. It, this is what it'll tell you. It's it, in a better era. It's good and it's possible to apply reason to the problem of human survival, to human knowledge, and to use it to understand the world and adapt it to our needs as human beings. And it gives an authorization and a sanction, so to speak, to that and says, yes, do it. Use reason. Figure it out. This is not the province of gods or the pope. This is a province of uh, this is the province of human reason, of science, of understanding and applying these things to human life. What philosophy does is gives you the sanction and the justification that, yes, reason is valid. You should use your faculty and not, you know, cower in fear and obey to what uh, some authority claims. Um, and that can and the ways in which 
philosophical ideas can influence and make possible um, yeah. and give moral sanction to that activity rather than censorship and so on. And that's a philosophic issue. Yeah. And, let me, and let me add something about philosophers, because it's not any, every philosopher who ever wrote anything is, is, the, is the major factor here. Um, what I think what she specifically focused on are, are the, the, the big system builders who developed fundamentally new perspectives on philosophy. So, you know, there's a way in which the, the like, the, 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 what happened after Kant can be explained by Kantian philosophy. And there, there was a, you know, there was a sort of a, a playing out of the logic of the premises of Kant's philosophy. And so you can sort of, you can explain, you know, Hegel and Marx and, and um, you know, the people who followed and developed the, the ideas in terms of Kant's philosophy. Um, but you can't really explain, there isn't, there isn't sort of, there isn't anything more fundamental than just than looking at, at at Kant as the originator of a whole new approach. And same with Aristotle. Redis, the rediscovery of Aristotle in the Renaissance started a logical development that, that if you take those premises seriously, there are certain things that follow from it. And you know the and the, the growth of science and and that sort of thing. Um, you know, it doesn't happen automatically. It takes minds of genius, but there's a way in which it's it's caused by uh, that those those ideas. Yeah. Uh, so let me add this because this is an interesting historical uh, thing. It's it's an interesting illustration of the um, relationship between what philosophy does and how history moves itself, so to speak. So when you talk, you you raise the point about the rediscovery of Aristotle's writings. Um, well, it's interesting how that, I mean, partly how that came about. I mean, they, when Aristotle's writings were lost, uh, and not just Aristotle's, but predominantly Aristotle's in terms of their cultural importance, uh, part of this was because of uh, certain Christian sects were persecuting other Christian sects. Uh, and so they left one part of the world and they went into Syria and settled in Syria and Baghdad and so on, and they brought the texts with them. Uh, and then you had this period where they uh, were translating these works into Syriac and to Arabic and so on. And and this was like, well, we've got all this stuff, and now we need to process this. Like, and how do how do we relate this to our religion? And like, what do we what do we think about this? Uh, and that, uh, but it was so in part kind of historical accident in effect that you know uh, it was some theological quibble over which uh, uh, one sect was persecuting another. And so they said, see you later. Uh, and they took a bunch of texts with them. But then what caused the flowering of uh, that period in the, what is it, 8th and 9th century, 9th, 10th century in, uh, in, in the Middle East, it was because of the rediscovery of the, these writings and so on. And then when you find them rediscovered in, uh, in the, the kind of Muslim Spain, the, the, you know, the... Uh, um, and then, you know, uh, one of the popes says, look, we need to have a translation project and send three different kind of like language people down there to translate these things. But then it's like, but what do you do with this? Uh, and for them, I think for in that period, this was like you getting like an alien tablet comes from another world. And it has this whole host of human knowledge. It's science, biology, science, sciences we'd never heard of or thought about. Yeah. And it's like you have to process it. And it was a long period of trying to think, how do we integrate or throw it away. Like, what do we do with it? And how much of it can we take on and blend with Christianity? And that is, well, there's no other answer than that, but certain individuals yeah. took the cho made the choice to take the effort to do certain things and not. And philosophy yeah. doesn't, yeah. And on the flip that. side, in the earlier period, you know, why were, they, why were those works lost in the West? Well, it was the religious mindset that sacked the Library of Alexandria. I mean, the, you know, the, it was... The, 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 the mindset was, you know, whatever's in these writings, if it's consistent with what's in the Bible, then, there are, then, it's, then it's redundant. And if it's not consistent, then it can't be true. So who needs them, right? And so, and so you know, if, if you take it that it, the people who took religion seriously didn't have any interest in, in what insights might be gleaned from the works of a pagan philosopher. That's just, that's immoral, right? 
Yeah, and so this is getting down to, again, why, again, so getting back to the question about why is phosphorus the ultimate driver? Um, it's because, as, as Rand puts the point, it's, man is a conceptual being. I mean, he functions by means of abstract ideas. This is just who we are. It's how we operate. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's what we do, right? So uh, when we think about, like, how, on the basis of what do we act? Well, on the basis of the ideas and values that we hold. I mean, what else is there? That's the only answer. And philosophy gives the fundamental uh, ideas and the fundamental values. So I like sushi. Not everyone has to like sushi, right? I don't know why, but they don't. Um, but it's, do you value your own life? Do you value happiness? Do you, or is it the ideas that to focus on the other world? I mean, where do you, what are your fundamental values? And that shapes a life. And what is your fundamental view about how you should use your mind? Is it fundamentally go by your feelings or is it you think or is it listen to authority it's it's at these fundamental levels notice that's not a question for physics it's not a question for biology though the biological issues are related right and it, it's it's not a question for economics it's what are your fundamental values can you use your mind successfully or not should you uh what kind of a world do i live in is there another world that i should value more highly than this one is it is, is it just this and death is the end it's those fundamental ideas that whether you're a scientist or an economist or you're a kindergarten teacher these are the things that move your choices and and and, and actions and when you think about culture wide it's culture is just a collection of individuals um you know like a, like a society it's just a collection of individuals with those same ideas motives values and if you watch those values as a culture shift in terms of what's dominant um, uh, in terms of those ideas and values, that's when you can look at the sweep of history and look at eras, and you can talk about what what are the th dominant cultural ideas in an era. And this is really kind of the stepping way back, kind of panning back for the bird's eye view. And this is often what you get in in Rand's presentation of it. It's that very high level perspective. So there's all sorts of questions like, well, what about this, and what about uh, Alexander the Great and what about his uh, in fact that he just fell off a bridge or something but it's yeah there are different factors that fit in but that's I think one of the reasons why it's ultimate is it provides the ultimate answers and justification uh, that direct the course of other things um, let me get to a question here from Steve on zoom um, <clears throat> I'll just Maybe I'll just take this up myself, just because it's a quick philosophy question. But okay. were there uh, were there any philosophers prior to Rand who challenged Kant? So Rand takes herself to be sort of the anti-Kant, um, uh, and I think that's a, an important. It, it's true that that's how she sees herself. Um, well, Nietzsche certainly did, um, but in certain respects, uh, but. But what Kant represented, and part of this is part of the problem, is uh, when I think of uh, postmodern, like when I think of the end of the Enlightenment, I think in, in end, Kant ended the Enlightenment because he, end, he ended any pretensions, or, or he ended our any pretension that we could be objective, that we could know the world uh, objectively, uh, and then that's essentially when uh, philosopher philosophy started to decline. Um, but even the philosophers who were very skeptical before Kant, it was there was still the premise that we sh we we can know the world, we just have to figure out how to do it, um, and they struggled and grappled with it uh, on the premise that you could know in principle, and then they tried to figure out how to do it, and he said it's not possible, and then that led phil uh, philosophers in a very different direction. They didn't know how to answer it, and even though they they re they challenge or rejected aspects of the philosophy. They ne could never get back to the idea that you could be objective, and we still haven't. Uh, and I think what Rand did, what's Rand's historical importance is she she has a view of the uh, the nature of reason and the nature of objectivity uh, that brings that back um, uh, center stage. Uh, and we're still, as a culture, at the very very scratching the beginning of being able to process that. Um, um, That's a little, um, let's see here. There's some ones that seem a little technical here. Yeah. Uh, if Ayn Rand was alive, this is coming from Steve on Zoom. If Ayn Rand was alive today, do you think she would hold that our Western culture is even more irrational than it was in the 70s and early 80s? I think that's a hard 
question to answer. Uh, um, I mean, you know, if you look at, I mean, the, the, there's a way in which the 60s really seemed like a time when American culture was really in decline. I mean, you had, you know, you had leftist groups setting off bombs. There were, there was like violent riots on college campuses. I mean, things seemed pretty bleak uh, at that time. Um, and I think partly as a result of Ayn Rand's influence through the 80s, you had kind of a, you had a, 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 a um, this, what they call the swing to the right. And there was sort of a, 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 a renewal of a respect for free markets and for business and for, you know, and, and, the, and, and a lot of economic growth and a lot of progress that happened in that period. So, um, you know, are there, are there ways in which it's, our culture today is more irrational? Um, uh, I'm trying to find the wording of the question. Um, yeah, is our is Western culture more irrational than it was in the seventies, early eighties? Um, yeah, I, 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 it's certainly not it's certainly not fundamentally improving, but it, but I think it's it's hard to assess when you're kind of in the middle of it, you know. And, and and I think one thing that's hard to assess is the influence that Ayn Rand is having. As it was, some of the other people in the, in various places are asking, in effect, you know, why is Ayn Rand not having more of an influence? I think it's hard to assess exactly how much influence has Ayn Rand had and how much influence is she having. She's certainly been super influential on a lot of some of the, the, the major business leaders of the last couple of decades who all have read her and credit her with inspiring them, whether they're followers of her philosophy or not, most of them are not, but they're but what what kind of influence does that represent and for the good and for the rational and for the positive, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's so hard to answer those kind of questions, I think, uh, in part because, you know, you watch, you can watch his, uh, history decade by decade, and you can watch it era by era. As an era, you know, stepping back, where you're taking everything from the 40s to, to, to 2020, uh, and you're watching that progression, you, there's a kind of an answer that you can give, but it's decade by decade, it's a little more tricky. Um, um, yeah, and let me go back because somebody made up. I was about to make, I was going to make this point, and then I decided to leave it out. But somebody on uh, YouTube uh, is just identified by a number, <laughs> like an anthem. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, but what I think in re response to the question, did anyone else challenge Kant? Uh, and I'll bring this up because it shows that what can happen when different ideas come into play or don't. So. The whole development in modern philosophy, and we're talking modern, this is coming from Thomas Hobbes, Descartes, Locke, Leibniz, Spinoza, you know, all, Hume, Kant, all of that lead up. Um, there is a certain thread that's going on, and it's that it's, I think it's really a question about objectivity. It's how can you know the world? And when your, your senses uh, and your faculties play a role in how you know the world, uh, and they, there's been there's a you know like Descartes has this famous like how do you know there's even an external world like a world out there uh, outside of the mind or your processing, and they those 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 thinkers um, held a common premise that the fundamental thing of which you're aware is ideas in your mind, and then so what you have to do is figure out but is there a correlate is there something out there in the world that matches up with in some way well or badly with what the ideas in our mind. And that was a fundamental premise going through the period. And then uh, toward the end of that period, around the time of Kant, you get a Scottish philosopher named Thomas Reed. And he looks back on this progression and says, this whole approach is mistaken. The whole approach is mistaken. And this is what leads to all the skepticism in modern philosophy. This is what's leading to the, the, the destruction of philosophy in the period. And he said, you have to take the premise that what you're primarily aware of are things, things in the world. That is what you are, the object, the primary object of awareness are things, not ideas in the head and you have to figure out are there things. It's the things, you're directly aware. And there was a, there was a school of thought kind of stemming off that called common sense philosophy. 
and that had a sort of a heyday a little bit in 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 the in the U.S. and in in Scotland and so on. But it didn't really take full hold. And then Kant happened, and Kant could have closed the door to that, and and they didn't know how to answer that. So you were at a turning point where it could have went gone more uh, toward the direction of Reed or toward Kant, and it went another way, and it went toward Kant, and it could have gone in a much better direction, and it didn't. Um, they didn't know what to do with 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 Kant's philosophy, and Kant very presciently said, "No one, everyone after me will have to deal with me." Not exactly those terms, but he says that in in one of his works. I don't know if it's the Critique of Pure Reason or whatever, and he was right. Um, because he made a, and this is part of the role of philosophy. He made a fundamental shift in the way we think of ourselves and the way we think about knowledge and the way we should think about ethics and what we can hope for in knowledge. I mean, he called it a Copernican revolution, right? Yeah. And he was, I think of it as the anti Copernican revolution, but yeah, he, he sees himself as a fundamental shift. Uh, and he was right. There's some other questions. Uh, let's take a look here. Um, Oh, yeah. So this is a question from Sally on Zoom. Uh, <clears throat> it says, Americans have always been very practical people, leery of grand philosophies. Um, she says, John, Di John Dickinson says, quote, experience must be our only guide. Reason may mislead us, end quote. Didn't this unusual take on philosophy by Americans have an enormous effect on the history of world, the, on world history since 1776? So America's practical focus, a leeriness about grand schemes, more experience uh, oriented. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, I think it's uh, so. The what what's so um, what's interesting about America is um, the founding of America was sort of the culmination of the Enlightenment. And and all the you had all these strands of in history that led up to that you know the the I so uh, well I always find it kind of interesting that in in sixteen uh, what is it sixteen when was the when were Locke's two treatises published sixteen eighty nine sixteen eighty nine yeah so yeah. sixteen eighty seven you have Newton's Principia Mathematica okay the, which which kind of launched the scientific revolution and two within two years you have Locke's two treatises of government. And so, and then, and then, a hundred years late after that, you have the founding of America and kind of the burgeoning industrial revolution. So uh, you have this, this explosion in scientific knowledge that leads to industry and economic growth and progress. And you have, uh, you know, the, these fundamental rational ideas about the nature of government that lead to the founding of America. Um, and. You know, I think Americans through the 19th century were focused on the business of living and on on uh, innovating, uh, inventing, producing, grow. You know, and um, uh, I don't think in that period that that America produced any kind of world historical philosophers to really uh, that were really on the level of you know Kant and Hegel and Marx and those, and, and and people like that. Um, and Americans had a very practical orientation. So it was, it was really, it was, I mean, this is, again, I think the best place to really look at this is in Leonard Peikoff's book, The Ominous Parallels, where he really talks about what happened in American philosophy and American thought in parallel with what was going on in Germany. And you had, it was when, when American uh, academics began to 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 you know to to really become a proper philosopher and a proper thinker you've got to go do a fellowship in germany and then you can come back and teach in an american university and it's when german ideas started to get imported back into america that things started to shift in this country um, yeah and ayn rand talks about the 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 americans you know, they're a practical focus they're success oriented and so on and the the in some sense, it offered them a certain kind of protection against some of these uh, the theories that really undermined reason. Oh, you can't know that you exist and things like that. They're like, yeah, anyway, I got a farm to run. Uh, and they don't really. But what happened, the, the, the downside of that is that, cannot, you, that then you ignore philosophy. Uh, I mean, part of the part of the reason for having a webinar on this issue is to give some sort of practical like, what's the point of doing this? What's the point of emphasizing these things? It's because you need to pay attention to philosophic ideas and don't dismiss them and think that, ah, oh, yeah, there's some airy academic stuff. It's 
if you if you I mean, I mean, you have to think about this and think about whether you agree with it or think it's right uh, and explore it more. But if you really come to hold the idea that uh, philosophic ideas, these fundamental abstract ideas about who we are, what we are, what we should go for in life and what we're capable of, that this is what drives people and it's what drives a culture and sh major shifts and changes in what those ideas are lead to very different eras. Then it it, it, it should lead you to be more attuned to, more interested in those ideas because you should be interested in where your culture is going. It's where you live. Uh, and so that's part of this. Um, so Aaron, me... we have this question from an anonymous attendee <clears throat> asking, you know, there are critics who say that Ayn Rand misrepresented Kant. And, and, um, and I thought, well, why don't we end on that? Because we're getting close to the end of time. I thought maybe you could say some things about that. I mean, my... Um, I'll just say this, which is that, you know, to, I mean, it's a huge amount of work just to understand Kant's philosophy. And then it's a whole, whole other uh, set of work to understand Ayn Rand's perspective on Kant's philosophy. And what she presents in her speech, in her talks and in her essays is, is a very essentialized and condensed overview. Um, and my understanding is that she has, you know, she has a very unorthodox perspective on Kant. Um, and th that's why people can view it as kind of misinterpreting him. But, but I think if you, if you, um, well, maybe you can say a little more about, about how her perspective on him might, might, might be a little bit unorthodox, but nevertheless is really insightful. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, Ayn Rand was not a Kant scholar in the way in which you'd go study with somebody in graduate school who's read everything by Kant and tons of secondary literature and teaches it. She does, she's not doing that. Um, she's a thinker in her own right, trying to develop her ideas. She read works in history of philosophy, some uh, you know, in translation, some in their original language, and some just through histories of philosophy, respectable histories of philosophy. Uh, to try to get a sense of the sweep of like what people have thought in the past and why they thought it. Uh, and so she's not a scholar on these things, but I think she's tremendously insightful in picking out and identifying uh, what, in essence, Kant represented. And I think she's actually right about that. But I mean, you don't have to take my word for it. it like as Keith said, I mean, you have to, to know how to think about that. I mean, I can tell you, yeah, it's all right, but it doesn't really help. Uh, my view is that she's not misrepresenting him, but it depends on what specific point you're talking about. In essential terms, her view is... She, he, he has a complicated argument to show that knowledge of an objective world is impossible. In principle, it's impossible. Uh, and that's what he did. And one of the ways she puts it is man is blind because he has eyes, deaf because he has ears, etc. And the idea was you, all of your awareness of the world is processed by your faculties. And hence, you never get reality straight, so to speak. Now, Ayn Rand thinks it's a completely wrong way to think about the relation of consciousness to existence, but, she, but that's in essence what it was. Uh, and and so like, again, we could yeah. dis discuss any particular issue if about Kant. I'm not a Kant scholar, but I mean, I've yeah, read Kant. If, if your consciousness has an identity, it can't, ident it can't engage in identification. Yeah, identity, the identity of consciousness is what makes consciousness possible, impossible, so to speak, awareness of reality impossible, impossible. is possible. And yeah. she thinks that it's, it's the opposite of that. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, so we're at a two minute warning, but let's, let's do this. I want to end on a different question. Okay. Uh, so Steve asks, uh, cause it's a, it's a good ender. Uh, Steve on uh, zoom says, in addition to objectivism, what other aspects of our current Western culture give us hope that we can avoid another dark ages? Well, okay. So I just recently finished listening to the audio book of enlightenment now by Steven Pinker. And I found that really, really inspiring and just really positive. Uh, just the, the, the progress that Pinker documents in that book. And this wasn't the first time that I was aware of some of the things that he talks about, because I, 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 I sort of follow that, the whole idea of progress studies and that sort of thing. I've, been, I, I, I've written articles myself that touch on those kinds of issues. Um, but just the way he systematically goes through all the incredible progress that, that the world is still enjoying is incredibly inspiring. And what I found interesting is that he that that there are there are a small number of thinkers today who seem to recognize the role that ideas play in um, 
these positive developments um, and, and in driving history. So there's, they, they seem to have a certain, uh, at some point, a, a certain level of understanding of this very issue that we're talking about today. So that is a really positive development. And if you have people who understand the importance of ideas and who value the kind of scientific and rational progress that, that and, and, the, and the, the real world results of reason and science and who are advocating for that, that's a really positive development. Now, someone like Pinker, unfortunately, there are certain aspects of his ideas that are, that are misguided and that I think militate in the, in the wrong direction. And that, that's a whole topic for a whole other discussion. Yeah. I think that kind of, the fact that people like Pinker and, and you know, Sam Harris and, and other, these, these uh, sort of intellectual dark web type thinkers, I think the, the fact that they exist and are doing some of, the, some of the aspects of the work that they're doing give me a lot of hope and inspiration. Yeah, that's true. And then we just need to like stave off their determinism. Exactly. And have a view about and have an, uh, un, an unconventional, con uh, like get rid of the conventional conception of morality, which they, they all hold. Yeah. Uh, and this is what Rand does and provides a justification for reason. Yeah. Okay, so we should wrap up here. Um, we're already a minute over. So just want to end by saying again, we have a webinar next week by Ben Bayer. Is there a rational morality? Um, so be sure to join us for that one. Send us your big questions, webinars at einrand.org. Aaron, thank you for joining me today. I could not have handled the Q&A without uh, your philosophical knowledge. So uh, oh. thanks a lot. It was fun doing this. And we will uh, see you all next week. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Heck. <laughs> Lost the... Yeah, I just hit leave meeting. Yeah, I'm trying to... F I lost my whole broadcast thing. Where is that? There it is. This is sneaky ARI behind the scenes. Yeah, the sneaky thing. <laughs> there it is. End meeting. Goodbye, everybody. Now you can go. <laughs>